Okay, so we have our second lecture on this dimension and now we are going to apply it. So let us first recall what the main thing what we learned previously. So there was the situation was that we have got some universe, A, right? this thing says in universe. Okay, and there's some set family up there. So there's some family S inside this A. Okay? And we want to measure uh, how complex this family is. And the crucial definition of this, the crucial definition was the set to be shattered. So like for a set B inside A, okay, we say that F of B is length of F. Yeah, so we look at the traces of the sets from F on the set B, okay, and we say that B is shattered if this F of B are all subsets. So, so we have got the set A, this entire universe, there's set B somewhere here, and how and if you look at sets F from F, like all possible subsets here can be as, as, attained as traces. So there's one set giving this subset, there's another set of prime giving this subset, etc. Like all subsets, all subsets of B can be attained as traces of the elements from your family. Okay, and the VC dimension dimension of F is the maximum uh, size of B such that B is shattered. Okay, so this is like the maximum shattered set. So this is like the most complex part in the set family up there. Okay, this is this dimension. And the crucial, the most basic property uh, was the sour Schauer lemma that says that if you have got, if the size of A is N and the VC dimension of F is B, then if you want the extreme case for the largest set family, the extreme case, the extreme case for maximizing the size of the family is like also more subsets, is all subsets like A choose the most D, yeah, all subsets of size of D, which can be formalized as size of F the most sum from I equal to zero of D and two brackets. Okay, yeah. So like, 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 like if you have your fixed size of the universe and your fixed this dimension, then the largest uh, cardinality of the family that attains this is like all subsets of size at most D. And that was what we, uh, uh, that's what we have proved last time. And Michael did a lot of instability, but one of the corollaries he had up there was one of the corollaries was that um, if the graph, if the class is nowhere dense, so if the class G is nowhere dense, uh, then for every R there exists D uh, such that the family of all balls, so like, mm, so I've got every graph in the graph class, if you look at the universe, like, just like if you look at all the balls of radius r from vertex z or v in vertex z, okay, so this is like a family, this is family for the universe being vertex of the graph. Yeah, so we look at all the guys within radius r and these are subsets of vertices, then this has got a VC dimension of VC dimension of OG. Okay? So there's about the neighborhood balls in mm, graphs of in over dense graph classes have got bounded VC dimension. Yeah, so this D depends on the radius. The larger radius is the more complex this family can be, and depends also on the graph class. But then there's a uniform bound on the VC dimension of balls for our the graph in the graph class. And this is what Michal proved saying that if uh, that there is a large that the size of the that like shattered set gives a large ladder and the large ladder gives large shattered set i mean there was some like uh, mm, mm, I mean, there was some very slightly ladder but this is the last time i used the word ladder today so i'm not going to go to stability here i'm just going to work with uh, this dimension here mm. and now i want to like 
these guys didn't appear by accident next to each other, led to the following, oh, led to the following corollary of these things, is that I want to have with like a polynomial neighborhood complexity of nowhere dense graph class. So I want to say G is nowhere dense. Okay, so let's get to nowhere dense and fix some graph in G. And uh, fix some radius and fix the radius R. Yes, and there's this D of R from this coral, this is like we call it coral one from one. So I want to say, hey, uh, let's and let's pick some set of vertices, some set of vertices, and now I want to look at the like we discussed the neighborhood complexity, yeah. So we discussed the family. What are the traces of the balls on this on this set A? Yeah. So what what if you look balls are like our neighborhoods, like right? guys within the sense R. And with one expansion, we have proven the lemma that uh, if you look at large set A, if you look at large set A, and you look at vertices here and look at the balls of radius R within the set A, then the number of them is some horrible constant times size of the A. It's not two to the size of the A. There's like it's linear in the size of A. The number of like traces of balls on on a, on a set of vertices of radius of something radius and this. Constant depends on the radius in the graph. That was for bounded expansion, okay? But we didn't say anything about nowhere dense at that moment, and now we are going to say something. So this was for nowhere dense, and here, okay, let's look at this family, and let's see what these two guys give us for this. Uh, for, let's look at this family, yeah? So A intersection ball for B is C of T. So we look at the traces of the balls, and well, this, I mean, if you take a family and restrict it to smaller set, this is the VC dimension cannot go up, eh? because the, VC, the definition of the VC dimension is just like the size of the largest shattered set. So if you restrict the family to like traces on some set, the VC dimension cannot go up. So the VC dimension here is also at most D. So by the Sauer Shell Alama, we have got that F is at most uh, sums from I to zero to D size of A. I which is something like, as we do like brute force, it's like something d plus one, size of a, mm, size of a to d. I mean, it's like by some brute forcing estimation, okay? So what we have just proven is that, hey, this is, uh, this is much better than to do the a, yeah? This is not linear, but this is like polynomial. I mean, d is a fixed constant depending on the radius and the graph class, and this is a polynomial of degree d. Okay? So we already have got like polynomial neighborhood complexity. Not linear as we had in bounded expansion. This is bounded expansion. It's not linear as in bounded expansion, but it's still polynomial. Okay? And now during their tutorials, uh, using the fact we, the things we learned at the lecture, but during the tutorials, we'll bootstrap this argument or we'll use some extra arguments to actually have here slightly superlinear function. It won't be linear, but it will be slightly superlinear. But we start with the polynomial to like as a as a like first first thing we can start. Okay, so this is the corollary here, and now we are going to look at something slightly different. But and so we are going now to depart from the nowhere dense graph classes and then go back to them at the very end. But we are going now to work with the heating set code. Okay, so this is like. This is some sort of like reminder of what happened last last week, uh, no, last week, a month ago, uh, but on the previous lecture, and how do we can we relate it to nowhere dense graph classes? So like using this statement about nowhere dense having balls having bounded this dimension and the basic facts about this dimension, we can deduce that the there's polynomial bound on the number like neighborhood complexity in nowhere dense graphs. We'll prove something better today, but. Uh, at the moment, that's, it, that's what we know. And now we are going to also, at the end, we relate it to nowhere dense graph classes, but for the next at least 45 minutes, we want to sparse it all. We're just doing some things on the uh, VC dimension and some set systems. So, yeah. Uh, so, what will we do? We'll be solving heating set problem. So, we have got again this F and some function F. Okay, and we say that the set H inside S is a heating set. If it hits every set, yeah. If H intersection F is empty for every F in S, yeah. So this is like I have got my 
probably is it. I have got my set A, and I'm hitting a few guys so that all uh, so that all sets from my family got hit, but I to buy at least one element from the from from, from, the, from my hit list. Okay, I want to nail all the sets from my family. Okay? And I will be calling like, and this is like a me some measure of complexity of our family. Tau of f is minimum size of h. So I, I'm denoting tau of f to be like the minimum size of a heating set. Okay, and this is like sort of a computational problem, which is actually quite difficult. How to compute the smallest minimum heating set? Okay, and this problem, you, if you go went for the basic algorithmic course, you probably already know that uh, the sort of algorithmic course. Uh, this you probably know that this is already like a really hard problem, finding minimum size heating set. Uh, and also, if you went over to Pankrise algorithms course, or you may have even have mentioned it at algorithmica, is that uh, this is also W to hard, which means that we don't expect an algorithm with running time f of tau of f times polynomial in the size of f and size of a. Uh, we don't expect this type of running time to solve this problem. I mean, the brute force n to the tau is more or less optimal. This problem. Okay, if you want to solve it exactly. But our goal now is now to try to make an approximation. So we all want to try to make an approximation. So our goal is to find find hitting set hitting set A to size not much larger than what than the optimum value. Okay? So our goal is to find a hitting set which is not much larger. Okay, not necessarily optimal, but not much larger. Okay, so we want to approximate that. Okay, so now let's do the greedy algorithm. I mean, as a baseline. So many of you probably have seen the greedy algorithm for these type of problems. Like, the natural thing is like, hey, let's at every moment take to our heating set the guys that hits the most, that like nails the, as many sets as possible. Okay, so like, take the following algorithm, start with H. There and while while h h is not a heating set, okay, like find x maximizing the number of elements in f that are not heat. Yeah, so up by maximizing. The number of elements of my family that are hit by X but are not yet hit by H. Okay? So those are the guys that are not yet hit but are hit by X. Okay? So that maximizes, so this is like R maximizes this one. Okay, and add this guy to H. Okay? So I'm always adding a guy that hits as many as possible new guys from my family. Okay? And the observation now is that this is some algorithm, it produces a heating set because it's like loops and it's a heating set and that's a new element every time so this is a, this is a decent algorithm and how good it is well if we define k to be like the optimum value okay if we define k to be the optimum value at every step it hits at least one k of the remaining guys okay like because the optimum solution hits everybody then at every step there's always a guy that hits at least one k fraction of the remaining guys because I mean the solution which consists of k guys the optimum solution that consists of k guys hits everybody so there's a guy that hits one k of everybody and also hits at every step one k of the remaining guys what I'm just saying here that's this blue is that there's always some x such that uh, like the set of f in f, so that x is in f, x is in f, and f is not heat, over all the sets yeah, over all the sets is at least 1 over k. Okay, there always exists an x such that it hits 1k fraction of everything, which means that after i iteration, after I iterations, the number of unhit elements, unhit sets, is at most the initial number of sets times 1 minus 1 over k to i. 
Okay? So like if we want to after I iterations, at every iteration, I keep at least one k fraction of all the sets. Okay? So it's like I start with M with like size of the family and it sets, and then every step I hit at least one over k fraction of unhit guys. Okay? And now if you do the math, now you say that okay, this is roughly e to the yeah, this is uh, this is the unhit number, this is uh, smaller than mm, this is smaller than size of f. I will just do it this way times e to the minus i over k. So when you reach iteration i being k times log natural logarithm of size of f, uh, you're going to go below below one. So everybody's hit. Yeah, for this one you go below one. So what we have already proven is that this algorithm gives the final size of h smaller than tau of f times natural logarithm of the size of f. Times the natural logarithm times the f of f. So this is like log size of the family approximation. That's what we have proven here. Right? The simple argument that you always hit one k fraction of f. Okay? And Somewhat surprisingly, this is tight in the sense that there is a paper, I will use this remaining space here, this result of Frege, that we don't expect 1 minus delta times log size of f approximation for any, de for any, de for any positive, for no, uh, for, for any positive delta, we don't expect like improving even the constant factor probably. I mean, to AI having like half here or like nine figures or something like that. So we don't expect this one, and this is not really peanut equal NP in the original paper. I think this is like unless polynomial as NP or NP is solving some quasi polynomial time, uh, we can't expect this type of approximation. Okay, so this is essentially the best possible in general, but. What we want to prove here is that, hey, we spoke about this dimension. This dimension was something like how complex the family is. This lower bound of Frege is like for arbitrary families, and in the lower bound we produce quite complicated families here. It's quite a complicated Boolean analysis and like a lot of stuff here. So this is quite a complicated result here. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, so let's, so there's some hope that if you assume something of this family, like bounded this dimension, you can get better. And this is our goal for the next uh, 45 minutes, or hopefully 45 minutes, is to prove that actually you can get a better approximation ratio if your family is bounded by this dimension. So I'm going back there. The theorem I want to prove here. After wiping out all these things. Some constant, there will be this dimension linear, so that's of course tau of f times log tau of f. Uh, not, yeah. So the there will be this dimension which we think constant will be here, but as a linear function, it's some Fourier function, and there will be log here, but the log will be of the optimum value, not the family size family size. Yeah, the family can be large and the optimum can be small, and we are now taking a log of the optimum, not the log of the size of the family. So this is like much smaller log in many cases. Okay, that's our goal. Okay, so we want to have like we want to trade the log of the size of the family by the uh, by the this dimension times log of the social size. And this constant here will be like something like eight or something like that. I mean, I don't want to compute it. I mean, but it will be like some reasonable constant. It's not like some nightmare here in terms of optimization. Okay, so that's like our theorem we want to. Cool. What does it mean randomized polynomial time? That means that like it's polynomial time and success probability probability is at least half. So okay, there's I mean with less than half the set H 
The set H will be not a heating set with, prob with some small probability, and that we can discover and repeat the ex experiment, but, uh, mm, yeah, but, uh, So we can, uh, uh, and like in some sense rounding it, I mean, there's some sort of probability naturally finding these things. Okay, so this is a theorem, but I want to prove something different first, and then say that I actually prove this theorem. So I want to assume that we get something important. Let's have some probability, uh, uh, let's have some, uh, assume that there's some probability measure of the set A. So me, some probability, distribution on A. So A is a finite set. What's the probability distribution of a finite set? It's just a bunch of numbers that sum up to one that says what's the probability of a particular element. Yeah, so this is like really like PA for A and A, so that's all PA over non zero, and the sum of PAs is one. Yeah, so this is probability distribution of a fancy name for a bunch of numbers summing up to one. Okay? Good. Uh, for finite sets. Uh, so this is the probability distribution, and I want to assume that set size f has got only small sets. What does it mean? Let's assume that for every f in f, uh, the, this set is large. At least some epsilon, which is some constant. That, so we, we are given this probability distribution, and we are giving some constant epsilon, and assume that all the sets from the set have got large measure. Okay? How we compute a heating set of such family? Yeah. So we are giving somebody apart from the input here gave us a probability distribution and some constant such that all the sets from my family have got large measure. What do we do now? How, what's the best way of now? What's the like stupid way of finding a heating set now if all the sets are large? Just do a random experiment. Yeah, that's like the idea now. Yeah, if all the sets are large, then if I sample a random element from this probability distribution, a set is hit with probability 1 over epsilon. Okay? A set is hit with probability 1 over epsilon. So now, if we repeat this experiment enough times, we're going to hit every set uh, quite soon, because there's like 1 over epsilon, I mean, epsilon probability for every set, so after 1 over epsilon, the set is hit, and maybe, maybe soon we'll hit everybody. Okay? So the main theorem, uh, um, the main lemma I want to prove here is that for some universal constant C, so C is some universal constant, and this will be like some really explicit, this will be like some 10 or something like that, but I don't want to make it explicit, there's some universal constant, uh, and I want to assume that this epsilon is smaller than half. That's like, I think that's a finite point. Uh, for some universal constant, if I take a sample, so if I take, a, so let's say um, X is a sample, of size, no, this constant times the DC dimension times one over epsilon times logarithm so one over epsilon. What does it mean sample of the size? That means that we are just taking this probability distribution and this number of times sampling element with repetition, without, I mean, we don't care. I mean, we just independently at random sample this number of guys, call this number S, call this number of guys, and uh, I want to say that this sample with probability with the probability that x hits f is at least one half. So I want to say that if I make a sample of this size, so I take this number of guys, and like this number of guys for sample guys from this probability, I will hit everybody from this set. And this is a non-trivial statement, because there's no size of the family here. Okay? There's no size of the family here. If you're doing just, just naive bounds, saying, hey, every, every set is hit with probability epsilon, at every step, so there's one over epsilon on average to hit one set, but there is m sets, or like size of family sets, then there, the log of the size of family will appear somewhere there if you do it naively, because you want to do union bound over all the sets from the family, so the number of repetitions, I mean, the number, the number of sets will be really kick in here, okay? And the point here is now, now, we are trading this log of the size of the family by the VC dimension, that's the non-trivial part, yeah? There's no size of the family here in this fragment, and this is like the non-trivial part, okay? So the proof should be non-trivial, it's not just a stupid union amount. There should be something happy in there. Okay, good. Okay, so let's prove it. But let's uh, do a different, uh, let's do a different, so the idea is to make a different experiment. 
So let's make a twice the large sample of twice the same size. So let's the proof is that let's make y to be sample of size two s. Okay, what does it mean? That means that I'm just sampling like elements y one up to y two s elements. These are elements of a, so this is like a to two s, and I'm sampling everybody independently with probably with this distribution of me. Okay. And then I'm selecting which guys are x. So what I'm doing, then I'm choosing like, so this is y, and then I'm choosing red and blue, so call it y red, y blue, random partition of y into two, into two size s sequences. Yeah, so what I'm really doing here is that I'm taking two S samples and then randomly coloring into S red and red S blue and thinking of like the red guys being the sample and the blue guys being some useful things in the analysis. Okay? So the idea is as follows. Instead of just sampling the sample, I get the same distribution by sampling twice as many guys and randomly selecting which S guys are my real sample. Okay? And think, so I think why the x is the red guys. Okay, this is like I don't want to prove it formally, but you could probably like you can. I mean, there's not big much to be proven. Like if instead of taking a sample of size two s, I'm taking uh, size s, I'm taking a twice as large sample, and then randomly selecting which guys are really the true guys from my sample. And you can think of this like you can first sample which guys, which indices from one to two s are red and which guys are blue. Okay and then sample the y's actually from the distribution and just ignore the blue guys. Yeah, so that's why once you f first you sample which guys are red, which guys are blue, then on the red positions you get this distribution. So that's the same distribution, okay? And in the proof we'll use these two ways of thinking that either first we choose which indices are red and which indices are blue and then sample the guys, that will be one point of view, and the other point of view will be like, let's first sample two as guys and then decide which guys are red and which guys are blue. No, I mean, in a sense, thinking of like we already know uh, which guys are hit by which guys and which are not. And by these two ways of things, we'll get our thesis. So let's proceed. Yeah, so these are our experiments. And what we are interested in, we are interested in the event E1. E1 is the event that A Y R does not hit. Not hit. Uh, so we want to prove want to prove that the probability of E1 is less than half. Yeah? So we want to prove that the probability that YR, the red guys, doesn't hit my family is small, less than half. Okay, that's what we want to do here. Excellent. So that's our bug. But we want to do, I mean, the goal our, I mean, we have got the blue guys, and we want to reuse the blue guys, so what we've been really doing here, we want to think it's the following. So, pick a set, pick a set from F. What's the expected number of the guys that are hit? So, like, say, mm, I mean, Y red. What's the expected number uh, that guys are hit, and this is like with repetition, that's just the bottom part. I mean, this is a sequence really, yeah? And if the R element appears a few times in the sequence, I count it many times here. So it's like, how many Y are hit F? Well, the probability that a single element is epsilon, at least epsilon, okay? And I'm doing it S times, so this is at least S times epsilon. Okay, because I mean, every guy hits before the epsilon, and I'm doing it S times independently. So let's think of, I, let's define the number t to be half of this number, half, and let's say, hey, we are, let's, uh, this is the main trick, define the event E2 to be, there exists an element of the family that is not hit by, uh, y, by the red guys, but is hit more than time by the blue guys. Of course, the same happens for the blue guys. I mean, this is like just, just 
Okay? So what does it mean? There exists a guy, except for my family, which is not hit. So E1, E2 is a subset of E1. So like, there's a guy not hit. So YR is not a hitting set. There's a guy. But for the same guy, the upper, the blue guys, hit it at least half the times it was expected to hit. Yeah, this is the expected value. Uh, this is the expected value. And hey, there's a guy that was, wasn't hit by, by the red guys, but the blue guys hit it at least half of what we expected. Uh, in this expected value of YR, mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, why do we have inequality instead of just equality? Because the probability of F is at oh, least okay. F. Yeah, this is like for fixed F, for fixed F. Okay, good. So this is the thing. And the addition what we want to prove is that this guy's, this event, I mean, there's very little in the difference. What we want to prove is that we want the following fact. We want to prove that the probability of E2 is at least half of the probability of 1. Okay? And we want to prove that the probability, uh, of, e probability of E2 is less than quarter. These two things we want to prove. Okay? This is the two things we want to prove. Yeah? That, I mean, the E2. The probability of E2 is not much smaller than the probability of E1, and, but it's more. Okay, and that would give, these two things will together give that this probability is almost half. Okay, so we'll use the view that we first select red and blue positions and then sample guys to prove this ones, and we'll use the view that we first sample guys and then use red, select red and blue positions to prove this one. Let's go. Uh, okay, so we are happy with this one, so let's go proof of one. This is the easier part. Well, this is really, uh, yeah, hey, uh, so we have got, let, so let's fix, so what I want to say is that there's an F, um, like, how to say it, I want to say that, hey, uh, if there's some unhit f, the probability that will be really, um, if there's some unhit set f, the probability that uh, this won't happen is really, really small. I mean, okay, so let's, so what happens here is that, hey, let's fix some f, f, and what I want to say is that the probability that the uh, y, uh, B intersection F is less than less than T. Condition on that Y red intersection F is zero. This is uh, less than half. That I want to prove. I want to prove that for a fixed set, okay, the probability that E the the conditional probability yeah, that in the if uh, like I'm restricting to the area of the probability space that YR didn't hit it, okay? I'm, uh, and I'm measuring uh, the fact that, um, I'm measuring the fact that I have got too few, my, my few cases up here, uh, it's less than T, then this, there's low probability. And this is really like, this will prove one. Why? Because, hey, Let's, I want to say that the prob pro probability of uh, E2 is at least half of the probability of E1. So take an event from E1, I mean, from E1, I'm, mm, you can think of this following phrase. Hey, let's first decide which positions are red and which positions are blue, sample the red guys, restrict ourselves to the area, uh, restrict ourselves to the area uh, where you are uh, having the red guys and then for F and like fix some element from F, fix, fix some from, uh, chop this area from the probability space. This is the area that YR not hits, not, doesn't. F, then chop this area for every point selecting some unhit element F, and then we want to say that inside every area, or like 
if the sorry, yeah, the, the problem that we're really something white blue. I mean, we're really for this fixed. Um, we can actually okay. I want to say that given. Uh, no. Okay, so I was over this. I want to say that given the values of y r. So this is like. Uh, so I want to say, sorry, I want to prove this one. This this is really needed. So what does it really mean? This, if you want to promise the course, this is really a random variable, yeah? So this is like, what's the, I mean, this is like, hey, given the value of yr, so what are the samples on yr, what's the probability then on y blue, uh, the, the guys are, the guy has said the most times, okay? So we are thinking the following thing. Let's first sample which repositions are red and which repositions are blue, then sample the red values, Okay, so this is like here, then this is like the entire probability space. Then there's the area when yr is not a heating set. Heating set, okay? And at every point here, we are resampling the blue, guys, at every event here, we are resampling the blue, guys, and we are proving that at every point, the probability that the blue guys are not hit, uh, I mean, he hit the set f too few times, is less than half. So we have got an element here for this, uh, for this even in the probability space, we pick some f of omega. This is the unheat set. And for this unheat set, with high probability, the blue guys will hit a lot of times. Yeah, and that would prove this, uh, and that would prove, the, that would prove one. Yeah, so like, we pick some even in the probability space for something yr where f is not a heating set. We pick some fixed set that's not heat, and we say that there's more than half probability that the blue guys will hit it like on average the, the correct number of times. Okay, that's what we are doing here. And these events are independent. We can drop the parts. I mean, this is the blue parts hitting F, and these are the red guys. Yeah, I mean the red guys are independent of the blue guys. Once we decided which guys are red and which guys are blue, we sample it first. So what we really want to do here is that we want to compute the probability that the Y B intersection f is less than t. We want to compute this probability. And now, uh, I mean, this is like, what do we really do? We have got some event, like heating, uh, this is like something as guys, and with pro independently, and with probability epsilon, we're hitting f, at least epsilon, okay? So these are really s Bernoulli variables, variables xi, that are probability that probability that xi is one is at least epsilon, okay? So this are really like, we are like s times having like, and we are asking whether it was the probability that the sum of xi's is at least t, which is half of the expectation. Which is half of the expectation. Okay, so what we are doing here, we're having guys with probability, uh, we are having, uh, we are really something S guys, and this S guys, uh, with pro each guy with probability epsilon hits F, and we are measuring what the probability that we are hit, it less than half of the average, less than half of what, what we expect in average to number of hits, okay? And we know how to measure it. I mean, there's something called the Chernoff bound. And now I'm going to take my piece of paper because I can never recall the proper word they need. So that one's, so what I want to say is that turn off size, so this is a box for the like probability key in part, guys. That's me. Says that the probability that x is at least 1 minus the expansion of the expected value of x uh, is at least uh, 1 minus e to the minus delta square mu over 2. And this is sort of the expected value of x, x, where where x is x1 plus xn are iid iid uh, and very good. Okay. Yep. And if you put delta in half, you get that the probability that x is at least half of the expectation, being at least, so probably less than half, being at most, this number e to the minus uh, expected value, so here we like epsilon, mm. 
times pi of the sample size, which is epsilon, S epsilon over eight. And now the point is that, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, this is like the sample size and there's like half, half and half up there. And now if you work with the sample size, this is e to the minus, uh, mm, this. Okay, fine. Uh, e to the minus, so sample size was up there, so epsilon is cancelled, so this is CD logarithm 1 over epsilon over 8. And now you can inflate C as much as possible to that this is tiny. Or well, less than half or whatever you want to have. Okay, now, I mean, you play with C. You can play, put C very large and have this one. I mean, this is like positive, I mean, this is more than 1, uh, or more than a like constant because one epsilon is not a half. There is some constant in here, and you can play this constant. So this is as small as possible. Okay? So, I mean, there's nothing very complicated here happening. You know, what we're really doing here is we're saying, hey, if you fix the red and blue positions are independent, so if you say, hey, the red guy didn't hit this set, then the blue guys independently have got very high chances of hitting it around the expectation. So probability of hitting it more or less than half of my expectation from Chernoff bounds for simple application of Chernoff bounds is very tiny. I mean, half is a very rough estimate here. Okay, that's what happened here. Yep. So, yep. so what we, we did here is that, hey, uh, yeah, so we, we sampled the reds, and for every even probability space, we took a set that's not hit, if it's not hit, and looked at the blue guys still have a good chance of doing it. So, like, if reds are not a hitting set, then the set that's not hit will be hit very well by the reds because there's only one set we care about here, not all the sets we care about here. So the event E2 is not very much different than the event 1, and now we are going to use it by looking at it differently, first sampling wise, and then uh, first sampling wise, and then going back to, um, and then trying to figure out which guys are red and which guys are blue. So let's go here. Let's go back here. And let's now do the following experiment. So this proves of one, so now proof of two. So let's first sample wise. So let's sample wise. Let's sample wise. Nice. And I want to say that what's the probability of E2 given, what's the probability of E2 given the values of y? So this is again a random variable, yeah? I mean, it's like, it's like samples y's and outputs the probability of E2 happening out there. Okay? Yeah, so this is a random variable. Like it samples y's and says what's the probability out there. Yeah? Okay. So what I want to say here is that, hey, uh, I want to say that if y, I mean, let's fix some set s. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I want to say that what's the probability that this happens? So what's the probability? I want to say the probability that f intersection y r is zero, f intersection y blue is at least t, condition y. So I want, I'm fixing one set f, and I'm having a probability uh, having a probability, mm, I'm having like a random variable again, this conditional probability is this random variable that samples y and for the fixed set f says what's the probability that actually the red guys won't, be, won't hit but the blue guys will hit at most the times. Okay? So this is the interesting point. Hey, we sampled y's, we fixed set f, this set f was hit a few times by y's, and what's the probability that really, like, all the guys become blue, that hit, and nobody became red? Yeah, this is an unlikely event, yeah? If we hit a lot of times, we on average hit like four times, three times, yeah? We hit a lot of times, and suddenly everybody became blue, okay? So I want to say that if y hit f less than t times, then this, well, let's call this p, py, yeah, py. This is a random variable py. Then py is zero. Yeah. So on the on the area on the like part of the probability space where y hit f, this is like py f. Py f. 
uh, when the probability space hits less than t times, then there's no chance of this event. I mean, there's no t guys that hit blue, okay? But otherwise, if y intersection f is larger than t, we are now partitioning a set of size 2s into um, half red and half blue in random fashion, and they want all the at least t guys that hit to become blue. That's a very unlikely event. Let's estimate the probability. Yeah? So this probability, pyf, is at most, but I want to say 2s minus t uh, choose s over 2s choose s. Yeah? So this is like, hey, I'm choosing s guys to become red, and they cannot choose any of the at least t guys that hit, hit, hit the set f. So what I did here is that, hey, I sampled my values twice, and I have my fixed set f, so every sample has got like one really information, it's carrying one information, whether it hits the set f or it doesn't hit the set f, okay? And now I hit the set f at least the times, and now I'm coloring randomly red and blue, I mean equal, equal coloring, so like the s red and red blue, and I want all the guys that hit become blue. So there's quite a low probability on that, I mean, so there's like this probability space, and only this number of sets, red sets are high up there. So let's do this like something like, okay, it's like one minus t over two s power s. So like in a sense, it's like re, re, like re, re, um, changing the something with rep, without repetition to something with repetition. And now let's do the brute force e to the minus over to s, this s, so this e to minus half, okay? Uh, let me go here. And so this is e to the minus, uh, so I now I'm going to insert the s value, so this is c half times d times one over epsilon times logarithm one over epsilon, so I'm going to put the logarithm here, so this is Epsilon, uh, uh, epsilon to the power c half times d times one over c. Yeah, so this I put here and remove this minus. So that's like that. Okay, so this probability is quite small. So let me put this way. But now we put some f set f. Okay, we put some set f, and the point is that now. What we really care about, I mean, this was fixed at f, and now we want to make a union bound. Yeah, what I want to say is that I want to make now a union bound, but I don't want to make a union bound over all, mm, I don't want to make a union, because what I cared here about, I fixed at f, but I only cared about uh, which guys from the sample are from the set f or which not. Okay? Okay? So what I really, what I really want to union bound, I want to union bound over uh, all the intersections with the, with, the, with the set Y. Yeah, so this was not really fixing set F, but it was sufficient to fix F intersection Y and do this analysis, okay? So the, for the fixed setting, which guys from my, for my sample are from set F and which guys are not, okay? I want to, um, I want to, uh, I have got this analysis, yeah? So I want to say that the probability that e, 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 e to y is smaller than, what I want to say is that this is smaller than the sum over all possible y intersection f, like this p y f, okay? And how many of these guys are there? I want to say that I, it's not 2 to the 2s. There's a sour Sherlock lemma. What I want to say is now that this is the Sauer Schumacher lemma. I want to say that this is really uh, sum from i equal 0 to d to s choose i times this bound. Okay, so what we really did here is that I want to say, hey, I have got the sample of size to s how many traces, which guys from the sample can be, uh, from my f are, 
from my family or not. I mean, yeah, I'm taking a set from my family and checking which guys from my sample are in the set or not, which guys from my sample hit the set and which guys not. Okay? And the Sauer Sherlock lemma is that I cannot see all the 2 to the 2s patterns, which guys are hit or which are not. I can only see, it, see the Sauer Sherlock lemma number here, which guys are in and which guys are not. Okay? So I have got this one, so that's the brute force estimation. B plus 1 times 2s to the d times this epsilon to c half 1 over epsilon to t. And now put the definition. Mm. Now this is like calculation c 1 over epsilon times 1 over epsilon times d uh, times I'm putting d outside epsilon to the power c half that's 1 over epsilon that's to the power d. Okay? And now we need to look at what's happening up there. Yep. What's happening inside? This is c times 1 over epsilon, times log 1 over epsilon, times d, times epsilon to some constant that we care about. Yeah, there's like 1 over epsilon here. Uh, what about this 1 over epsilon? Why is this in zero? Maybe I made some mistake. Times t half. Yeah, this epsilon should disappear. Why I didn't disappear it? I should have disappeared this epsilon somewhere here. But this one over epsilon didn't disappear. Mm. Yeah, because t is s epsilon. Yeah. So this is t half, so this epsilon disappeared here. That makes a lot of sense. Sorry for that. Yes, now I'm happy. Uh, because now I'm tight. So what I'm just going to say here is that, hey, there is, uh, but the D shouldn't disappear. There's D, there's D, there's D, and the D is outside. Why the D is outside? No, the D is okay. Good. Uh, hmm? But this D shouldn't disappear. Why there's this D here? Aha, uh, uh -huh, because I don't want to do this estimation. Sorry, I will just... I want to uh, I did two brute force thing here. I want to have got two epsilon s over d to the power d. Now I'm happy. And so this is the estimation of the Bernoulli of the deck n to k is epsilon. I'm using the I'm using here the estimation that n to k is at most e n over k to k. And this is like up there. And now. Uh, now there's an extra two in front here, but this this this, this disappeared. Uh, there's two in in front from here. Yeah, and now I'm happy. Good. So this is uh, so what's happening here inside the bracket. The point is that I'm playing with the constant c, but the constant c is here up there, and it's here in the exponent. Okay, and now epsilon is less than half. So what I ca can do here is that by inflating this constant, I can make this thing as small as possible. Yeah, because if I inflate this constant, this is less than half, so there's a half to power, and there's C in linear thing, so this will kill this one pretty quickly. Okay, so what, uh, there's this one over epsilon here, but there's epsilon to, to the constant that I'm inflating, so this thing will kill this one over epsilon here, because this is a better polynomial, and uh, it will kill this constant c because it's like less than half to the power c. Okay? So I'm just saying here that by taking c large enough, I can take this to be la less than b plus 1 and I don't know, some 1 over 100 to the power d. Okay? So, I mean, I can inflate the constant c for the, this one to be very small, 1 over 100, and then this is like tiny, yeah? Because there's linear term and 1 over 100 to the d. So this is much less than a quarter. Okay. Or D is one over it's two or something. Yep. So I mean there's some calculations. I mean there are also the nodes and they're not fully legible here. But the point is that uh, yeah. So what, what really happened here is that hey, let's do it different way that first sample y and then sample let's first sample y and then sample which guys are red and which guys are blue. And once we sampled once that it hit set F many times, 
it's very, very unlikely that suddenly all the heats become blue. And the other pattern is that if we know which guy, if we have the sample, it's not possible that all the patterns which guys are hit and which are hits my set F and which others can appear. The sour Lama says that there's only like n to the, I mean two s to the d of them, not not two s to the d, not uh, to the, the s thing. So there's like this bound that we used here. Yeah, and that's the moment when we use this dimension that giving our sample of size to f s uh, like the number of patterns which for like which guys hit my set from my family and which guys does, doesn't hit set from my family is quite restricted because polynomially not exponential. Okay. But it's the only point when we yes. understand actually. Yeah. So we but can for, for the bound on the F. If we can just assume bound on the F instead of the the size of the F. Yeah, but this is not, we are not using the size of the F here. We are using this number of traces on my sample. That's the important part, that we are not doing N. This, this is just 2S. This is number of sample. We are just saying, hey, we sample 2S guys. S is like D over epsilon. Yeah, so it's much larger than D, OK? And what we are using here is that we sample these 2S guys, and we say, hey, if I fix my guy from my family and say which guys intersect my guy from my family. Yeah? And the point here is that it's not just to, to, or to do the sample size, which guys hit, which guys not. There's a very little number of traces, which guys hit my set from my family, which guys not. And this is the main moment when we save. Okay, so this is like, uh, this is the proof. So we have proven our lemma. So we have proven our lemma. So what we have proven, we have proven our lemma, but we didn't prove our main theorem, yeah? We have proven our lemma that given this probability distribution, and the problem is that the probability, I mean probability, the fact that the probability distribution, all the sets are large in our probability distribution, we, sampling just gives us a hitting set with good probability, sampling few guys, relatively few guys. But now let's use the rest of the board to understand that this, some, this, Thing is not much different than what we started from. So let's it's now a scary part. A scary part is like let's try to find this this probability distribution. What do we want? We want what do we want? So we want these numbers. We want these numbers p a for all a in a, and there should be non, I mean there should be probabilities. Okay. They should sum up to one. Okay. We also want the epsilon, some epsilon greater than zero, at least zero, such that for all for all f in f, the sum over a in f in a is at least epsilon. Okay? That's what we want, and you want Epsilon to be as large as possible because the epsilon, the one over epsilon, governs the size of the heating set. Okay, so we want to maximize epsilon, and this is a linear program. Yep, I just wrote a linear program for finding best best possible. I mean, what I want, I want the probability distribution with as large as epsilon as possible because, like, the size of the heating set is like one over epsilon times log one over epsilon. Okay. So I want to find probability distribution for as large as possible epsilon, and what I just showed is that this is a linear programming task. Okay, but we don't know how big the epsilon will be. I just want to realize it's somehow the optimum solution. Okay, so let's try to. So this is an LP. Let's call it LP one. This is a linear program. Maybe I have got some variables. I got some linear constraints, and I maximize some linear, uh, some not very complicated linear linear expression. So like epsilon is a variable and PA is a variable. Let's write a linear programming relaxation for the heating set problem. What's well, this one? Great. This we have got x a for all a t a. Okay. And we have got we want to hit us we want to hit every set. So for every I write it here for every f in f we want the sum a in a x a to at least one. Okay. And what we want to minimize, we want to minimize the sum of xa a, 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 in f here and here. Okay, so this is our linear program for like 
the, the fractional relaxation of the heating set. Yeah? So, I mean, if you want Xi to be 0 once, there will be heating set, but if you relax them to be arbitrary reals, you get some relaxation. Okay, so there's some fractional heating set. Yeah, I can take a fraction of the vertex so that every set is hit with weight at least one. Okay, so this looks very similar. Okay, how? So let's make a transformation. This is LP two. So I want to make uh, two observations. So the observation LP one to LP two, two is that if P A the epsilon is a feasible for LP, for LP1. So I have got a solution here. How to make a solution here? What, how to make from here to here? What, what's happening here? I want here the sum is at least epsilon, but I want to sum it be at least one. So what do I need to do? Divide by epsilon. Divide by epsilon, yes? So I define x, a. P A over epsilon is a, is a solution to LP2. Okay? And what's the value of the solution? What's the value? Here the sum was 1. And here we measure the sum. Yes, of value 1 over epsilon. Okay? Good. And in the other way, if I have got a solution for my P2, so if X A the solution for LP2. How do I make a solution for LP1? I need to scale it down. Right? The, the sum was here the value, and now I need to, the sum to be 1. So I need to scale it down. Yeah? So I define S as the sum of x i's, and define P A, P x a over S. Yeah? So that the sum is 1. And now, here it was at least 1 over epsilon. One, F, eh. so now what, how do I define epsilon? Here it was at least one on every set, but I scaled it down by s, so now I need to put epsilon to be one over s. Yep. Because I scaled all the numbers down by s, so that the sum of the numbers is one, so now on every set, I'm at least one over this previous sum. Yes, so that was the value, yeah? That was the value here. So what I have just proven here is that, hey, if I have got a feasible solution of epsilon, from LP1, I can find the value 1 over epsilon for LP2, and the other way around, if I have a, and for LP2 with value s, I can find, uh, I can find the value, I can find an optimum solution for the for the epsilon for with epsilon being 1 over the value here. Okay, so if we define, so it makes sense to define tau star of f to be the optimum value of LP2. So tau, remember, was, was the integral size of the heating set, and it's like the fractional size of the heating set. Okay, it's of course smaller than tau of L. Okay, so this is the optimum value. Then what, what we proved here is that the optimum value of uh, LP2 1 is exactly 1 over tau star of L. Yeah. yeah, we have just proven that 1 over tau star of is here. The optimum value, like the epsilon, is this one. Okay, that's what it's for. This is essentially this two LP solve essentially the same problem, but just rescaled. Okay, good. So what does mean? We had our our heating set was at most c times d times one over epsilon times log one over epsilon. So this is c times d times tau star of f. Okay. So what we have proven was that the heating set we produced, we promised that we probably take this, this half, a random sample of this size, with a random sample of this size will be a heating set. Okay. And what's this size? This is like our constant that was somewhere in definitions 10, 100 something. This is dimension the fractional optimum times the logarithm of fractional optimum. So we have not only proven our original theorem, we call our original theorem. Our original theorem said, I'm wiping out this, uh, this things here. Mm. Sorry. Our original theorem was that we find, can find a heating set of size at most order of d times tau of f times log tau of f 
Okay? But we have replaced this tau with tau star. I mean the solution to the LP, the solution to the fractional relaxation, which can be much smaller than the integral one. Yeah? So what we have really proven here is that uh, what we have really proven here is that hey, uh, you can find a heating set which is bounded by k log k, where k is where k is the size of the fractional relax the value of the fractional relaxation of the heating set problem. Yeah? So this is like in a sense that LP rounding scheme, yeah? We take, we solve the LP, we scale it down to interpret it as a probability distribution, and then sample, yeah? The algorithm really what does, hey, solve the LP, scale the values down so that's the probability distribution, and then look at the one over, like, one over the value, original one over value, and make an appropriate sized sample, and check if the sample is a solution, if not repeat. Okay? Yeah, that's, that's our final algorithm, yeah? Solve the LP, scale it down, and do sampling. That's all. Up here. Okay, good. So this is like thing, and we have got our thing. Uh, so what does three mean? Well, first there is a way to derandomize it, but we don't want to discuss it now. Uh, but what I want to say here is that now let's go to our lower dense graphs and let's recall that. Uh, hmm? Let's recall that uh, the balls have a bounded VC dimension. Yeah, there was a theorem saying that uh, for every G which is nowhere dense, and for every radius, there exists a function D, so that for every G is G, this family of balls. has a VC dimension small G. Okay, that was the thing that we started the lecture from. We were discussing this one, we're calling this from the first lecture. And now, so what I want to say, so what, what is the heating set of the set of balls? Like X is a heating set, this family called F, so F, if and only F, X is a distance or dominating set. Okay. Heating every ball of radius R means that you're, you see everybody within distance r, which means that they are distance r dominating set. Yeah, that's hitting balls of radius r is being a dominating set, like covering everybody with your own balls of radius r. Okay, so here is that. Okay, so what we can prove here is that, and the LP is really the same. I mean, if you write the LP, is really the same. What we can prove here is that if g is nowhere dense, then you can find distance r our dominating set uh, in polynomial time, in randomized polynomial time. I write polynomial time because you can derandomize this scheme, but in polynomial time, but, but we did randomize. We did randomize uh, with of size order of the, this constant d that depends on the radius, yeah, this is the constant depends on the radius in the graph class times the I would write k star of k star, where k star is the like value of the, this is like LP of. So there's like natural way of writing this one as a distance r dominating set, yeah, and every vertex can be taken with some fraction, you minimize the total fraction, and for every f, this will be like ball, for every ball of radius r, yeah. The sum of, sum of all gods is at least one, yeah. So you can find a solution of size say LP optimum times log LP optimum times the VC dimension that comes from the graph class and the radius, so it's constant. Yeah, so this one disappears really. This is like you're killing the old intention. Yep, so this is like uh, the nowhere so in our dance we have got like log opt approximation to the dominating set problem. This one's our dominating set. That's like punchline. Good. So that's the main thing I wanted to show you today. But I have got still 15 minutes, 18 minutes, so I want to go. Yeah, any questions here? That was quite tough. But.
So I mean the pun the punchline here is that once we solve, I mean the, that there's the algorithm in the end is quite simple. You solve the LP relaxation, scale it down so it's probably distribution, and we use it to sample elements from the fitting set. I mean sample elements according I mean uh, sample elements proportion with probability proportional to the LP value on this element. That sounds very reasonable, like a reasonable heuristic. And it's really a problem in DC dimension, this gives like good approximation. From this dimension, this gives good approximation up there. And what we said is that the fact that in nowhere that graph classes the balls have problem at this dimension shows that this is like distance are dominating set approximation. Good. So now I want to make one more step which was supposed to be an exercise on the tutorials, but I think it's better to go over it. I mean, I think it's a very difficult exercise, but it's a very useful exercise. And I think it's better to have it recorded and discussed up there because it will end up like that anywhere in the tutorials. So I want to say that we proved that the balls, or Michal proved last lecture, that the balls have the bounded this dimension. Now I want to prove that the weakly reachable sets have the bounded this dimension. Okay? So I want to prove the following theorem. I want to prove that the following theorem that if three is nowhere dense, and I have got some radius, there exists some constant b, which depends on this class and this radius, okay? Such that for all graphs in the graph class, and for all orders, sigma of b of g, the weak reach of the sets of the weak reach R of G sigma B for V in V of G. Yeah, this is again like the universe going to F. Yeah, the, the, this is again the universe set of vertices, but we're not looking at the balls, but at the weak reach of the sets, which are subset of the balls. Okay? So this VC dimension F, of course, it's like a subset of V of G, is. Yeah, so I want to say that there's like uh, the this dimension of weak reach sets is also bounded, not only the balls, but also the weak reach sets. Okay? That's the theorem I want to prove. Uh, and the trick now is to use uh, uniform quasi wideness. The statement is clear. I want to have weak reach sets, and not only weak reach sets in some optimum ar arrangements. I want to say that for any arrangement, even like with the weak reach sets being huge, like completely suboptimal arrangements, still the weak reach sets cannot be too complicated. So for any ordering you want, the weak reach sets cannot be too complicated for me. Okay, that's, I mean, that's important fact that there's for all orders. It's not like there is a minimum weak reach sets order or something like that. They're for all orders, this will happen. So the trick is to use uniform quasi wideness. Yeah? So what does it mean? That if somebody gave us a set A, a inside B of G, which is large, yeah, which is huge, and some and there are some numbers m and there's some number there's some radius, the radius r is here, and the fact is that the size of A is some greater than some function of m, and the radius, the radius is somewhere hidden here as a global constant up there, then there is a sub S, which is of size constant. So this is bounded by some function of R, some power of the radius. And there is some set B, set A minus S, of size M. So that B is to R independent in G minus S. Yeah? So we can kill a few guys, and this a few depends only on the radius. It doesn't depend on the M. We can few, uh, kill a few halves, so that this set has got a two, in, two are independent set of size uh, as we want. I mean, this is super, I mean, this was really some M to some horrible function of R. Yeah, this was like some polynomial with some horrible exponent dependent on R. Mm, I don't know if we had this proof or we had worse proof, but you can prove this one. Okay. Yeah, so this is uniform quasi wideness And the idea is as follows. Hey, take a huge set that is shattered. Assume that this has got very large with dimension. Take a large set, a huge set A that's shattered. Okay? Take a huge set A which are hard shattered. Look, apply uniform quasi wideness, get a tiny set to, that's killed, 
and the thing that's independent scattered in the rest, and see how it can, I mean, so can B, I mean, A is shattered, so B is shattered, how B can be shattered, yeah? So let's do it this way, so assume that, assume A, a is shattered. So what I want to prove really here is that for sufficiently large M that I will choose later, A cannot be shattered. Yeah, I want to say that for large M, M, A cannot be shattered. Yeah, this large M will depend on the radius and the graph class. So uh, on this, really on this constant S here, I put the size of S, cannot be shattered. M cannot be shattered. Uh, and let's assume that it is, if A is shattered, so is B, so B is also shattered because it's a subset, but what can happen here? Yeah, we have got this set B here, which really looks like this. They're like far away guys from each other if you kill this small set S here. Okay, and the size of S is smaller than S, which is function of R only. Okay? Uh, which is function of so there's you kill a small set of halves, and you have got guys that have got distance larger than two R between each other. Okay? So you cannot, what I want to say is that, hey, let's, but, okay, so there's this set B, and say that B is shattered, which means that there is like, I mean, if I want to take these guys into my independent set, into my, I mean, if you want to have trace having these two guys, but not these two guys, that means that there's a vertex V that has got these guys and this guy in my, uh, in my weak reach other set, but doesn't have this guy nor this guy in this weak reach other set. Yeah, so we want to say that for every B prime inside B, there exists V in V of G, so that we create other set with rights R of G sigma V intersection B is exactly B prime. Yeah, that means shattered. Yeah? But now the point is that, hey, how does this paths look like? How do this, I mean, I want to say that, hey, so let's, took this graphics B, so I have got, this is my ordering, sigma, it's my ordering sigma, there's somewhere vertex in here, up there, and there are some, so here are the guys from B prime, and here the guys from B prime, and what this guy says is that, hey, there's actually, mm, yeah, there are some paths ending in these guys. Okay? And what I want to say is that only one this path of these paths cannot intersect S. I mean, I cannot reach two guys without intersecting S because S is a two R scattered set if I delete S. Uh, B is a two R scattered set. So what I want to say is that, hey, What I want to say here is that I want to say the statement that uh, B intersection weak reach other set with radius R but in G minus S sigma V, okay, is at most uh, one. What I want to say is that if I look at the weak reach other set after I delete S, I can see only one guy from B, okay? Because these are two R scattered, and these are paths of length at most R. So I cannot see two of them within a path of length at most R. Okay? So, yeah, but so I need, so like, I, B is large, and for any things, what I want to see in my weekly shoulder set in B, and what I don't want to see, there's a vertex realizing it, but any vertex can realize only one guy not touching S. And S is very tiny, so you can't realize too many like weakly shallow set profiles by intersecting by going through S on by going through S, which is tiny. So let's make it formal. Let's show the picture. And let's take a vertex V. Let's take uh, some element uh, X in S. Okay. And I want to define and let's find some radius R hat smaller than R, zero, and I want to say that, 
pay a path P of Vx r hat. This is the path from V to X of length is path. And let me write it in white. Path from V to X of length most r hat that maximizes the leftmost guy. That so that the leftmost of this path is as right as possible. Let me give you an intuition of what I'm doing here is that, hey, this is the guy from S, and I want to realize some guys from, from my B, B prime. I want to realize some guys. Yeah? So if my path wants to cross this, wants to pass through this element of S, I can have I can use this path or I can use this path as a two step go here but obviously the solid one is better because it you I mean it allows more guys in the recursion set remember that in the recursion set we are asking which guys I can reach by a path of length and most r so that the end point is the earliest guy is the leftmost guy okay so if I want to reach some guys through this element of S, so that this guy is the second guy on the path, like after distance two guy, it's go better to go by the solid line than by the dashed line because it allows more. I mean, it uses. I mean, it still allows to end here, not to end here. Okay. So if I start from vertex V and pass through vertex S from S and use our hat steps or at most our hat steps then I want to like use a path that like uses as light vertices as possible. Okay. So that's the intuition here. And what I want to say here is that, hey, so the question is like, so the question is like, what's the leftmost guy? I mean, which guy? And the question is how many or how many the elements of B are to the left of P of Vx r hat. So what I want now to define is that I want to define folia. We are almost done with that because I want to define folia on P is the following. So a vertex V, I want to define the following information. I want to understand which guys are reachable without seeing uh, using the vertices of S. Yeah, this is like the first element. And the first the second element will be like how many elements like number else of B or to the left of P uh, V X or half for all x in s and r hat between r and zero. Okay? This is my information. What I want to say here is that, hey, if somebody said me, hey, the vertex v, it can reach these guys from the set b, and this intersection b, uh, these guys from the set b without intersecting set s, okay? And if you want to go through set S through actual element X, keeping X as the R hat guy on the path, then still this, uh, like this number of first guys from B, leftmost guys from B, are still okay for you to reach to finish. Are still okay for you to like end your path with. Okay, they are still available for you. And I want to say, observation is that if all your of v1 equals folio of v2, then the weak reach of the set are g sigma v equals the intersection b equals the weak reach of the set v2. Okay? What I want to say is that, hey, this information is enough to compute your weak reach of the set. Because it says the following, hey, if you want to reach how what guys can be in the in which I've said, hey, the guys that are reachable by paths not using S, 
And for every guy with S, I mean, what's the best way of getting to this guy with this number of steps you want? I mean, how many space you still leave on the leave on the left for the other for, for the elements to reach finally? I mean, I'm just saying that this is enough to deduce what's your what's your you know, initial set. You just take this guy and then inspect uh, the elements of S and see hey which guys are reachable within each, each distance in the initial set. Okay? But how many folios there are? The number of folios. Well, this is m plus one because it's a size most one. Is m plus one, and this one. I mean, for every set here, so for every guy from S and from every of this R hat, I again have got m plus one options. How many guys? I mean, from zero to m. Okay, and now if I S depends on R, this is R, so I can choose m huge enough. So that this is smaller than to do the M. Yep, I mean, this is a polynomial in M with some fixed exponent. So I can inflate M so that this is smaller than to do the M. And I should get all subsets as we reach other sets. And I don't have enough folios. Period. So the intuition here is as follows. Hey, if there's a huge to our scattered set, I cannot get all subsets solve huge variety of weak reachable sets because to get somebody in a weak reachable sets, although this path doesn't hit S, but then you can reach only one guy, so that's very poor family of subsets, or you pass through guys from S, but then the information, if you reach guy from S, the only thing you care about is like how many steps you made and what was the rightmost guy you invalidated from your set B. And this is because set S is like independent of M, it's just a function of R, this is still polynomial in your size of a family. This is not exponential. So you cannot so you cannot get an exponential all subsets because the dependency here is polynomial, how many weak reachable sets you can get. Good. So I want to finish now, and on the tutorials we'll use this theorem to prove the one plus a, size of A to one plus epsilon neighborhood complexity for uh, lower dense crop classes. Thanks.